My other question, you say that love for the fundamental part of the people. At the same time, you said that children have an ability to learn manipulating, for example, one of these artifacts, mm -hmm. name, I, mean, I do not remember recently. Could it be that there is a fundamental difference between this artifact and the family? And the fundamental difference is that artifact has no expectation. Mm -hmm. And the family has expectation. Expectation that I love. Since this artifact has no expectation, the sponsor if you are not punished or eliminated for whatever it is if you do not press the proper key, because there is no proper key. In this, with the artifact, there is no problem of love. But in the family, there is problem of love. Mm -hmm. Because it's in the family where love should be. Could it be that indeed the real problem is somehow a lack of encounter such that love could indeed be there in the family? That is part of what we're trying to do, which is to shift the notions of expectation, which is very hard because of the cultural, cultural weight of education to shift it so that people allow their children to arise as they are and flourish as they are in love in their family. And that's, that's actually what we're really working with. And then from there we use whatever, whatever tools we have, whatever issues seem to follow the passions of the children. Sometimes the matter of expectation appears not with words, not with gestures, but with time. You do not have enough time the encounter of the because the child is either slower or the mother is faster yeah. than a particular opportunity of coherence. You're absolutely right, Inverto. If we can create that ground within families with these children who are so deeply challenging for their families and the world around, we, we create miracles. We just alter everything. And it's yet it's the most difficult work of all. So now uh, we have Sebastian Gallego. His talk is titled "Experience: Experiencing an Integrity Observer." I come from the background of studies in sociology in the university in Chile, and but before that. I came from the background of attempting in the beginning to read light reading like the Tree of Knowledge or light reading of that sort. And something that happened to me when I was at the second month of study is that I arrived to my home really happy but also really excited and I said like, I finally discovered what is the problem with sociology. And my mom asked me, but what's the problem? And I said, the person is not at the center. What is important is to speak generalities about many people, to make laws, to make predictions, but what is happening with the people, in the, with the person, actually, in that situation? We are actually so accustomed that we have a world like people, in which there is no distinction of the individuality of each person. During this process of conversations with Umberto, with Jimena, and many other people that I have met along the way, I found out that there are things, and I hope I don't disrespect with what I'm going to say, stuff like consultancy and coaching and even some methodology. Uh, and when I went to my first research, I was really nervous because I was here actually in the state as an assistant in a research. And I got up from the airport, I had my backpack, I get into the car, and I had no idea what I was going to do. So I was freaking out. And I said to my friend, who is a 60-year-old uh, hippie who lives in Eugene, who lived his 20s in the Bay Area, so you can imagine how he is. And I told him, Dennis, what are we going to do? I have no idea. I'm freaking out. And he told me, that's great. <laughs> because that's the kind of spirit you need to get when you go into a community. So, 
what he was trying to tell me is that let go of everything that you may know, let go of any theory, detach yourself from all of that, and go and be able to experience and to learn from the people. Don't bring a theory or a hypothesis to try to constitute in that situation. Just be open. So this distinction about loving, that, which has been discussed over here, I think that really makes sense because when, you, when I go into those places, I, I consider myself, like Stephen Miller would say, to be a person to go up and speak about the pompitus of love and how that appears in the community. So I realized that there was no theory nor a model to which I could ascribe in order to see the legitimacy of persons and their living together. When you have a, an idea or a model or an understanding, it works when you try to explain something. But when you go and you try to experience when it's happening, it, it no longer makes sense. When I found myself in the favelas in Brazil, when you see <coughs> little boys like this, uh, confronted with a person like this, with a gun, with a, with a, uh, with a gun, with, with drug dealers, with hunger, with no water to drink, there is no model that works. And in that sense, the, the phrase, the map is not the territory, it really makes sense in that situation. So the only thing that I can do as a researcher when going to a community is that I can only listen and learn how is it that people do what they do when realizing a human community. So I can only participate in the research by observing human behavior and human interactions which afterwards may lead me to reflect in a different domain, which may be cybernetics, which may be cultural biology, biology of cognition, or some model about system thinking. And distinctions such as trivial and non-trivial machines, which really make sense when you are in that context, or distinguishing the pattern which connects, that those distinctions are not part of the phenomenon that is happening there which is human, human interaction generated in a community. And many times that I was part in this research about studying how communities, which are realized by persons, generate value and well-being, I realized that when focusing the reflection upon well-being, you, you, you invite people, persons, to generate a different space of reflection. Because the thing that I was listening continuously was that participating of the change, or participating of what we do, and being an agent in that transformation of the community is really important for the people. So it's no longer the mission of the organization, or the vision, or the methodology on how the organization is going to work. It's what people feel in their inner feelings, and how that is translated in the relational behavior that they have with other persons over there. It showed me also that being part of a particular human community is an experience that integrates different aspects or features or the people experience, of the people experience that interlaces with the presence and the actions that the people take there. I can identify in human community three particular aspects. First, individual life experiences that make sense with the purpose of the human community. Then, incorporating the fundamental concept of the community living. So for example, if we're here in a community about cybernetics, concepts such as non-trivial machines, the pattern which, the pattern which connects, uh, languaging, and all of those distinctions bring us all together. By having a history of transformation, of coexisting, by distinguishing those stuff in our experience, and our experiencing our living together is what makes that all of us may be here. Oh, and the third one, sorry, is realizing the community living, which is actually what we are doing now here. Sharing experiences, conversing to each other, encountering each other. And many times people may say that, oh, dude, that is obvious. But many times the obviousness obscures what is so obvious. And when we don't pay attention to that, we don't see the roots of that. So when we say something is obvious, we are just remaining watching the tip of the iceberg. But the Titanic showed us 
that the tip of the iceberg is just one part. When studying in these human communities, honestly what I do is just go and listen. I don't have an agenda, I don't have a method on what are the strategies or the balanced scorecard and all those, for me at least, inventions to control and regulate what other people is doing. And while only listening and learning with the persons, I realized that a different domain of conversations appears within those persons. And that conversation invites them to a reflective space. And I'm really thankful of the distinction that Ranoff made the other day about reflection and reflection. When he was presenting that, uh, that loop of reflection in which when I see that element and I reflect about it, it transforms me. And when I'm transformed, that element is also transformed. And that circularity that I, at least I listen it, it's the process that I invite people to, in, to live as a journey, as a community. And those spaces allow a space of self-consciousness about what are the core elements in the configuration of the particular manner in which, may, in which we may want to do things together. And when we are self-conscious, about that, it is fundamental for conserving such core elements and consequently the particular manner in which we want to do the things we do. So, many times in organizations we don't have the time to stop and say, okay, how is it that we're doing what we're doing? And even further than that, we don't have many chances to stop and to reflect upon that frame it in well-being. So when you invite people to do that, you can find a richness, you can find diamonds that were not observed because it was not in the concern of, even further than the concern, in the consciousness of people that they are able to do that, to recover those spaces of self-love like it was discussing this morning, the spaces of encountering each other respectfully reflecting upon the well-being and the value that we create. And afterwards, in reflections for myself, making the report about that, I distinguish it that there are two fundamental states in which human inner feelings or how people are within an organization may be. And that is, as it was discussed this morning, stationary fragmentation when people is not self-centered, when there is a conflict of emotion or desires, when the persons are feeling stressed, when they are not able to do what they want to do, or to even further distinguishing what is it that they want to do. And the other state that I distinguish is a brightness. It's a being self-centered in what I'm doing, or what they are doing. So, summarizing all of this, what, what I'm inviting to see with these distinctions is that an observer, in, when participating in, in, a, in a research about a human community, is not a person that is here, apart, making distinctions about a system. That observer, that integrative observer, it's an invitation for all of them to behave in such a manner. But not to see a system apart from themselves, but it's an invitation for persons to take a look at what they feel about their emotions and how is it that we can harmonize and relate to each other in the conservation of well-being. And I think that I'm going to say only that. Critics, comments, comments, whatever. <coughs> different anecdotes. Yes, please. Do you ever find circumstances in which self-consciousness is actually a problem? Uh, yeah, it might be. For example, uh, there is a funny thing that I have found in organizations, and that it's hierarchy. Because whenever I see hierarchy in an organization, for me, and Afterwards, for the people with whom I reflect, it appears to be an illusion. Because the work does not get done in a hierarchical manner. 
when we go and reflect about how people do what they do, it all happens in networks of conversations. It's coordinations of actions, it's coordination of emotions, it's coordination of inner feelings, how we live together. A hierarchy, I believe, that it's an invention in order to control or regulate what other people is doing. So, spaces of self-consciousness about how we are in an organization may entail reflection about discrimination, about submission, or even further than that, being self-conscious that I'm discriminating or that I'm sub uh, subordinating other people. But just like Catherine was inviting a while ago, when you invite to a space of a, of a loving relationship, even the persons that distinguish that are able to choose if they want to change their behavior or not. And in the cases in which I have found people trying to control and regulate, those persons live a journey of a lot of pain in order to escape the need to cling to control. And when they are able to release it, they appear spontaneously in collaboration of and spontaneously co-inspiration appears in those relationships. And yes, in those situations, when you are with the person being aware that it's controlling, you can just see in their faces how they, when they are becoming aware of that, they can say, okay, I don't want to see that, because they are not able to become responsible of that in the moment. Or their faces changes in order to start the process of transforming that for releasing control and entering collaboration. That, that's the point? Yeah. I think we sometimes use the words and self, or somebody is being self-conscious when they become concerned about what the expectations of the others are of them. And it's not really self-consciousness and awareness of awareness of self, but it's more a, a awareness of an a judgment externally and focusing on the result of what they're doing so that that interferes with actually being present. So I think it's a different use to the word that we often use in daily life language, rather than I think as Sebastian is using it now. Is that what you meant, that kind of self-consciousness? Um, well, I, I'm happy with what he was talking about. But in some ways, I was actually thinking more about whether there are forms of coordination that we care about in which Remain, their remaining tacit actually helps them to coordinate in ways that we yeah. are concerned yeah. and think are, are positive. Exactly, and, yeah. and those things that may be tacit are also those things that may be obvious. Mm -hmm. But when we enter a space of reflection about it, we become aware of that. Mm -hmm. So it's that recursion of consciousness mm -hmm. and encountering other in conversations about what we are conscious. And it's a matter of saying, I'm going all in with what I'm feeling and with what I'm thinking. And when there is that transparency with the human community, there's space for everything. Everything may happen. Over there, over there. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I experienced your invitation as carrying with it a number of systemic implications. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation to consider our practice when we claim to be doing social research, which could be a reflection to uh, invitation to reflect on what we do when we do research. Uh, and it's also a, a reflection about what we do research in the name of perhaps community development as this particular aspect of it. So all of those levels of systemic implication are carried in your invitation for me. Um, and I have my own views on all of those. Uh, I guess my, uh, my specific question to you is, how did Sebastian arise in the eyes of those you were with? And what was the narrative, the story you invented to tell about yourself? To tell about myself? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to tell you how it was when I got the first day to my research in the favela in Brazil. So, I was going there, uh, I, I, was, I visited Brazil before that like two times, and Portuguese really resembles to Spanish and to a little bit of Italian, but I don't know Portuguese. So I was speaking a mixture between Italian, Spanish, and some words in Portuguese that I learned from music. 
So I, I added a little bit more of nervousness to myself when I was going to <laughs> because I, don't, I didn't know if I was going to understand and all that. But I got there, there was a whole bunch of people who previously had participated in processes of consultancy with McKinsey, with Accenture, and with that kind of models of consultancy for organizing how they do what they do. So people were freaking out. There is another guy coming, he is going to tell us what do we have to do and how we have to do it. Oh no, he's going to bring a lot of BS once again. Yada yada yada. So I arrived there. I bought some stuff, some cookies, some things to drink, like Coca-Cola, Guarana that they drink there. And I put them on the table and I invite them to talk. I told them, I'm Sebastian, I have no freaking idea of what you do, and I'm here to learn with you, and I'm here to collaborate with you. So I told them what music I like, I told them what were my interests, and the only thing that I wanted to do with them the following two weeks was to learn how we all can generate value and well-being for this organization that we name XXX. Some of and that's what, how I presented myself. And during the conversations, during the encounters we had, during the lunches, during the breakfast, we get to know each other. And honesty appeared really easily. And transparency appeared. They found in me also a person in who they could trust to speak about a problem that they could not speak about with the manager because they were afraid. So I just invited them to experience that, that they felt upon me, to experience it with their, with their partner, with their partner, <coughs> because that space was not present. So that's how I present it. So if there are two more questions over here, and then... I'm a little nervous about my language in here. <laughs> but you spoke of the somewhat illusion of hierarchy mm -hmm. uh, being a, a cover over all the networks of uh, conversations that are going on in order to get things done. Have you seen or do you have any ideas about what kinds of forms of organization or institutions would encourage uh, the development and the utility of the networks of conversations to a greater degree than exists? Okay, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with hierarchy and from where do I understand it. Uh, for me, hierarchy is related with a manner to control and regulate what is happening in the pyramid of an organization. And I found its basis in the 1800s. I found that that psychic era had a desire of competition, of make, being more productive and more efficient. But in the 60s, there was a guy named Herbert Marcuse, and he spoke about the end of utopia. And he said there are some old-fashioned needs that society has which is productivity, to regulate, to control. But he's inviting to a space of utopia in which there are new needs which need to be present, which is the need for resting, the need for loving others, the need for having peace, the need for eating healthy, etc. So when I see and I put myself in that frame of distinction, I have seen and I have experienced organizations which, are, which have been able to change, for example, instead of being human resources department, to change themselves to human relations department. <laughs> and that subtle distinction, it's just one word, opens up a whole different world in how humans are seen within the organization. And there are cases like, there's a cosmetic company which is called Nature. Their slogan is well being well. When you go to their facilities in Brazil, you can see that there is a common lounge in which they have food for vegetarians, for many different of variety of foods. They have gyms, they have swimming pools, they have spaces for a daycare for their children. You can go and directly speak with the manager. They have a department which is called Ovidoria, which is listening. So it's a department to, to, to which you call in order to be listened at. If you have a problem, you call them. 
it could be a family problem, it could be whatever, it may concern your multidimensionality as a human being. So there are some cases. And also matristic. We are one last question. It's great to see it, it's clear how you how passionate you are about your work. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in uh, how your research, what you learn, changes you. Me? Yes. Wow. Well, that's one of the tough ones because <laughs> when you go to a favela in Rio de Janeiro, uh, it's not an easy experience. Uh, the first time I went there, it was before there was the the, the generation of some troops that they created the, the police and the army in order to pacify those places. And just like psychologists have uh, cleaning meetings in order for them to clean themselves, and I also myself need that afterwards because when you go and reflect upon well-being, beautiful things arise. You see that there is inspiration, that there is respect in situations in which you don't understand how respect can arise. But the context of that sometimes is really harmful. Walking down a street on a mall, which is a hill where all the African-American people live there, they are secluded in that space. And you, the only things that you see are machine guns, and you see people afraid of leaving the house because there may be a gunshot. When you see on the houses the bullets, uh, that is something that needs some time, that you need some time for yourself to recall. Because that experience in particular was too tough. The first research that I did on my own. So, as we will say in Chile, I throw myself to the lions for the first time, but it was a great learning experience.